you for joining us here at Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage Mississauga, and each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the fascinating stories of the city of Mississauga together. This week, we're pleased to be joined by Omar El Sharkarwi, who is working with us this summer at Heritage Mississauga, but in this past academic year, through the University of Toronto Mississauga's internship program, Omar had a placement with us where he explored colonial connections to street names here in Mississauga. The project focused on select street names, some long-standing traditions within our community in terms of the names themselves, Dundas Street, Truscott Drive, Winston Churchill, Cothra Road, and others. And Omar's study explored the era in which they were named and some of the inspirations behind why they were named. And again, in this episode, we'll explore some colonial connections to the naming of Mississauga. So we're very pleased to be joined by Omar, himself now a recent graduate of the University of Toronto at Mississauga. Well, joining us this week on Ask a Historian is, El, is Omar El Sharkarwe, who, uh, through the University of Toronto Mississauga Historical Studies Internship Program, worked with us here at Heritage Mississauga this past year and exploring topics of, of, uh, of uh, the naming of our landscape and its colonial connections uh, here in the city of Mississauga. And Omar, I will say from my side, walking with you through that research project and all the work that you did. It was a fascinating um, uh, process that you went through to kind of explore the eras and traditions around the naming of places, uh, the naming of roads, specific roads that we identified, um, and kind of what that means on the interpretation of the landscape and how historiography in the modern, in the modern world really connect on, in a physical sense, on places that people recognize, uh, you know, they drive on these roads. And, and of course, we're all part of these conversations around, you know, settler and colonial uh, colonization and, and kind of that appropriation on the landscape. And so it's been a fascinating uh, process to, to walk through with you. So uh, just, you know, thank you for joining us here to explore some of the findings that you had through your research project. Thank you, Matthew. First, let me begin by saying it, it, it was an absolute privilege to have been able to conduct this project. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about it today. And I'm sincerely grateful for the opportunity to have worked on it uh, with you and with Heritage from Society. It was a fantastic opportunity. Well, and, and again, the, the honor truly is all ours. You did an exceptional job. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you can tell us about the project itself, uh, kind of what inspired it, um, and how did you go about researching it in terms of, of the broader concepts of place naming? Because I know from, you know, when I had this idea born and we talked about it, you, you expanded beyond even what I had initially thought as, as an evaluation process of, this, this proce of the process of naming. Uh, so just wondering if you can tell us about the project itself and just how you went about the, uh, the research. Of course, I'd be happy to. Well, the project obviously got started with the internship, and it was because uh, in looking to to do something that's related to local history, I also wanted to see if I could bring my own perspective through historical studies into it. Uh, my focus in historical studies has always really been on uh, colonialism and decoloniality and imperialism around the the idea those ideas and histories. Uh, and so I think this project captured its essence quite well. I don't remember if it was you who recommended first or if it was I who forwarded the idea, but it came up somewhat in our conversations when we were talking about creating the synthesis. And uh, it very much blossomed from there and evolved into a project about the meaning and uh, imbued in the names of the everyday landscape and urbanscape and places around us. Uh, and really I'd say there's towards that specific thread about place naming and road naming. Uh, I would say it's specifically been inspired by a number of things at that point in time uh, and, and how I was, how we were able to reach the subject. Uh, sort of through my own experiences in studies of decoloniality, this, this has always been something major uh, in terms of understanding naming, in terms of understanding uh, public commemoration. One of the earliest encounters I had in university in my own sort of curriculum on colonialism was this movement in South Africa. It was one of the big things that actually inspired this project. It was, uh, it was in the mid 2010s, 2015, 2016, I think. And it was called Roads Must Fall. And it was uh, centered around a campus at Rhodes University in South Africa, around the statue of Cecil Rhodes, 
famous uh, British imperialist in Africa in the you know, era of late imperialism in the 19th century. And uh, his legacy was seriously called into question by the students and his, the statue they had on campus of him became sort of the, the center point of this dispute where students wanted the statue taken down and they eventually succeeded in doing so. Uh, but afterwards, there were a lot of these discussions around uh, what this actually accomplished and where to go from next because the university didn't change its name, State Rhodes University, for example, even the statue was taken down. And an artist actually uh, painted a sort of shadow where the, where the statue once stood. It was a very remarkable piece of art to effectively say that you know, the statue may be gone, but its legacy is, is forever here with us. And so this angle of public celebration and commemoration of individuals and in, in tandem with a colonial connection uh, was really inspired by that. And also the protests that happened over the course of 2020 that, that were uh, 2019 and 2020, of course, was a big year for public action and for, and for protests. And a big part of those, of course, they were concerned with a lot of things in those protests, but a, a, a big part of it uh, was also targeting uh, road names or statues that were dedicated to people who, uh, you know, protesters or, you know, the public believed should be revised or people who, whose legacy should be questioned or shouldn't be celebrated through statue or through road names or park names or building names or however. Uh, and so based, I think based on that, uh, that's how we went forward with this, with this project. And we wanted to sort of apply it to Mississauga to synthesize the public history uh, the, the very specific rootedness and sense of place we have in Mississauga and the community that's around us with these big uh, historical ideas around the meaning of decolonization, around who is included and excluded from the landscape and how a landscape is, whose, whose image is a landscape effectively shaped in. And so the broader concept, that's, I think that's how it was, it was taken on from there. And then as the project evolved, uh, it, it, it became more theoretical and it was, it became synthesized with the academia a bit more. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I, I'm vividly remembering these early conversations and I think you're right. I think we both kind of had a synergy that, that developed into this project. And, uh, the, uh, I, I am, uh, I, I am remembering our conversation and as you've mentioned it now with Cecil Rhodes at, uh, Rhodes University in South Africa, nice. um, of, you know, in the, infancy of our project you know that was something that had taken place and was, was front and center at least in terms of, of the narrative we were exploring of course we have seen that locally uh, manifest itself in the recent removal of and protests around and the removal of the statue of Edgar Ryerson at Ryerson yes. University so you know these are not isolated incidents um, and, and there is some commonality although you know different contexts but there's commonality into that review and um, I guess, public protest against figures from history that have been elevated to yes. that, that public presence. Yes, um, absolutely. And, 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 like, and, and likewise, we're now seeing those conversations around, uh, I don't know if simpler is the right word, but uh, you know, road, road names themselves are not the statues, and statues, I think, are easy targets, uh, in a sense, and, and road names yeah. have a little bit more of a, of a, a nuanced connection on the landscape uh, yes, over yes. a broader geographic perspective. Um, but I think we're seeing those conversations evolve. Yes, no, absolutely. I, I would completely agree in that case. And this is something I even addressed in the, the first in the series of articles uh, where uh, our focus in this project was, of course, on Mississauga. And there isn't really much. The interesting thing about the project is it's focused on public commemoration and colonial connections and celebrating you know, key individuals in history who are connected to a colonial past, but there isn't actually much of an exploration of statute in the project. Right. Uh, we, we really did zone in on, as you said, the road names, which are definitely a more subtle uh, sort, of, sort of celebration, but also arguably an equally important way too, because a road uh, inhabits uh, you know, a really, really large space. Uh, it's, it's a way by which your memory is sort of spatialized across a, you know, a, a, pretty, a pretty large area. A statue is only there really in a fixed spot. Uh, and of course, a statue is an easier target because it, it's a direct facsimile of the individual. It really represents them better. And also a statue in its, uh, when people deface or take down a statue, it's a lot more, it's a lot more of a, a I think, a, a spectacle. It's something that's a lot more publicized. Whereas a road, of course, if you change your name, you just you know, swap out the signs. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that brings to mind something I saw uh, a couple months ago with, around Edgar Ryerson, of course, but 
they were talking uh, kind of a uh, kind of tongue in cheek about replacing I think it was Jarvis Street in Toronto um, and at the time I said you know there's one statue that comes down but there's something like 1400 road signs <laughs> that carry the name so you know the re replacement is a little bit different of an animal and then you think in terms of you know Dundas Street or Winston Churchill and I know those things are really that we will talk about here here locally but one of the things that I was fascinated because uh, you know we had this idea of a project but how, what kind of sources did you find that helped you explore the bigger concept around this theme of colonialism and place naming? Well, I would say that the sources very much depended on the time period or specific road or space that we were looking at. So uh, I, I, can, I guess I can speak to this in more detail a little later, but uh, we, of course, divided the project up into... We looked at different roads across different time periods in Mississauga's history, you know, the late 18th century, uh, the early 19th century and the family compact period, uh, and then also through the 1950s and 1960s, the post-World War II period in Mississauga. And so depending on what I was examining, I would use a different source for it. Uh, secondary literature, I would say, was among the most valuable. There's actually a surprising plethora of secondary sources that speak to these subjects. A lot of them may not really speak uh, directly to the road name itself, but it can have really important approximate information about it. So for example, if we're covering Dundas Street in the late 18th century, a number of other roads that were named in, in the governorship of, uh, of, uh, of, of Simcoe, uh, John Grave Simcoe, when he was governor of Upper Canada, a biography of him actually helps a lot because it, it, it's sure it's a biography about the individual, about his history, his life, but it also talks about his administration and, and in turn it talks about the road names uh, that were christened during his own time. And so I would say universally secondary sources across the board uh, were quite valuable. Primary sources in some cases also really helped. Uh, they could be something as simple as maps. And when we get on later into the 50s and 60s, we actually begin to have, you know, bureaucratic documentation. Of course, you, you know, you, you, things, things are better documented in the 1950s and 60s. We have transcripts of, for example, city meetings, or we have direct plans uh, for urban plans for a road that's being laid out. Uh, and so we're able, we're able to actually triangulate better how a road name originated. The later into the history, we, we do kind of get, whereas uh, early on, sometimes we have to speculate a bit uh, or, or try and approximate an answer uh, uh, in some form. Uh, I mean, another big one, too, as I talked about the theoretical parameters, is, is, uh, is the theory of critical toponymies, which is this, uh, it's this major interdisciplinary theory uh, in academia that just very simply, uh, it looks at public spaces and names within them and it tries to examine them as arenas of uh, political and social conflict uh, over you know, who's included and who's excluded in the landscape, how these names and these spaces uh, in a way reflect power relations in, in, in a given society. And it's, it's a theory that's applied very broadly to you know, various historical contexts and times and regions. Uh, and we were able to apply it to Mississauga. And so, so uh, they were also valuable sources, uh, books and articles that were related to this. They sort of formed the theoretical groundwork, if you will, for, uh, the, for the methodology that we made and for, for how the project was approached. So I, I would say these sources overall were the ones that, uh, that, we, that we covered. I think, I think the, the, there's a question in here, and, and, and bear with me as I, as I walk through it. Um, the, I, was, I was going to touch on that power relationship and how it reflects itself on the landscape itself, uh, landscape today. Um, you know, not only the decisions of, of who things, who and why things are named, but who named them. Uh, and you mentioned earlier the image in which things were named or inspired. Uh, you know, can, can you speak maybe very briefly on the way in which, say, intention, uh, there was an intentional effort of naming uh, things after colonial Britain uh, or, or uh, the British Empire uh, early on in our history, but that's also reflected in decisions in the 20th century as well. But part and parcel with that, there is almost an erasure that is a conscious effort at the same time. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if you can touch on, just to expand on that a little bit, because you, you've mentioned that, uh, just that, that, that power relationship uh, of how that interplays on the landscape. 
Absolutely. I mean, in, in the way of especially indigenous uh, relations too, this is, this is quite an important question uh, because and especially early on in the late 19th and early 18th century, this, this crucial period of settlement uh, in around the area of Mississauga and Ontario as a whole up Canada at the time uh, is really significant to point understanding this because there's this theory I really, really enjoy in critical toponymies. It's, I think, very profoundly important about vacancy, vacancy in relation to colonialism. And it's not just about thinking of land in terms of vacancy. It's also thinking about uh, sort of the names and the designation of the land is also vacant. It's something being a, a blank slate of sorts. Uh, and I think that idea is important in defining uh, the sort of momentum of, of, how those, of how those early colonial names took root. Uh, because it, it, it was actively a way in which colonial administrators thought of the land as something that was vacant as there was no, there was no uh, precedent or there was an indigenous frame of reference that they didn't want to use or they cast about or sorry, cast away from them. Or didn't uh, value. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or they didn't value. And so in turn, those names uh, would be the ones that were rooted in, in the, and I think they, they really reflected the, uh, the marginalization of both indigenous names, but they were also a kind of an extension of the overall marginalization of indigenous people during the time period too, uh, because it was it was in a way you know putting down a stake, making a claim uh, to try and you know fashion a space as, as being colonial uh, through a name. Yeah, I, I think you know th that this is you know, outside of our, our our focus area today, but you know interesting further exploration is maybe perhaps you know some place names have. Uh, returned or at least been adapted that are not colonial um, yes. and, and remain. I mean, the, the, the town of York becomes the city of Toronto in 1834 and, you know, 130 some odd years later, Toronto Township becomes the town of Mississauga and the city of Mississauga through a, a name selection. Etobicoke remains as a, as a name place. Uh, Shingukuzi, uh, also a local name reference, all of indigenous origin. Uh, and so you, you, there is this interplay on the landscape that, yes, you do have a, a colonial perspective and it is prevailing. There are, there are a great deal of colonial emphasis, but you also have uh, these, these names that predate a colonial period that still remain on our landscape. So, yeah, there is an interesting power relationship there. Uh, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think that's actually one of the things that uh, begins to complicate the narrative of colonial toponymies later on to the history that we get. Uh, because I, I think early on during, say, the you know, late 18th century, early 19th century, in the period of, of major settlement and colonialism, uh, settler colonialism uh, in, in Canada, that's when uh, the marginalization of, of sort of indigeneity is at its peak also. Not just, not just, because, of, uh, not just because of, you know, the, the time period, but also because of the institutions that accompany, you know, the, for example, treaties ceding land to Canada or the residential school complex that was also emerging, you know, so it's, uh, it's really overall, uh, you know, it, there, was, there was a very thorough process of modern marginalization and the names were also thorough in that, in that sense too, but you're right, the later, the later on we get, it becomes interesting and it's something I wish I, I um, hope in future can be explored more. Because this project, there were a lot of things that yeah. we that we could have covered. And there were all things that we actually wanted to cover on the basis. There's a lot of very interesting toponymies that we can talk about in Canada and interesting relationships, uh, you know, across a variety of time periods and themes. And I think this is one of them that I, that I wish could get explored more. Uh, because these indigenous names, that their, their emergence later on, this complicated narrative toponymy. Because I, we want to think about why these names were included and also who included them. Because these are important questions about uh, about why a name is chosen and who chooses the name, because that can tell us about who has the stake in being able to uh, sort of shape the landscape as well. I was going to say define the place in which you live. I, I do find it, uh, you know, just to, to maybe wrap up that part of the theme, but it is interesting when we look at the power relationships, and I agree with you entirely in terms of, you know, who's naming it and when, what image are they shaping the landscape in which they are now defining by place names. But in the hierarchy of names, we have a lot of colonial place names within municipalities that take an indigenous name. <laughs> so you have, yes. you have, you know, there's an interesting interplay there as well, and again, maybe a future exploration. But um, in our process, uh, um, we selected uh, or identified uh, focus points in terms of our names and uh, that we yes. would focus on. And 
honestly, some of them were the low hanging fruit. I mean, and others were a little bit more more of a research in terms of identifying their their origin. Wondering if you can just highlight uh, uh, the names that we covered, the names that we focused on in the research project, and then we'll jump into exploring a couple of them in, in, in depth. Absolutely. So I would say that um, the way the project ended up going about uh, is that when the name was selected, usually it was a prominent road that we thought. So Dundas is a very obvious example uh, because there's been flashpoints around that road. It's a very, it's a major road in Mississauga, it runs through Toronto as well. Uh, same thing with Winston Churchill. These are very obvious names, very obvious sort of targets for research uh, that we can look at. But when we began to look at these things, uh, the broader history began to emerge and in turn also more names came into being. Uh, so if we were looking at the late 19th century, for example, the period in which uh, John Grave Simcoe as governor lays down all these all these names and changes a bunch of names to like uh, Toronto to York, Niagara to Newark, and lays down all these new highways. Uh, there isn't just Dundas Street. You also have, like I said, a lot of things get renamed, a lot of towns and counties get new names. Uh, and and uh, you realize that Dundas is, isn't just an individual case. It's not just an exception. It's, it's sort of part and parcel of, of sort of a wider program or trend in naming. Uh, Dundas is as much related to say Addington County as it is to Young Street, for example. Those all emerged during the same time period. Uh, and so, yeah, when we did triangulate a time period, that's a, a, through looking at a specific road name, these broader trends emerge. And it's the same deal with uh, Winston Churchill as well. We ended up looking at Winston Churchill Boulevard and uh, we embarked on a journey to look at even more specific names in Mississauga, like Truscott Drive in the Park Royal Region, and that we also believe are part of the same uh, that same time period, that same spirit of the times in terms of in terms of naming. And so, uh, I would say these these are some of the names that we arrived in that were deliberated apart. Uh, the other period we covered was also the Family Compact period, uh, and that was also there was an obvious choice there it was Robinson Street. Then we ended up going into delving to more and we realized this, this is a very localized phenomenon. And there's actually a lot of these uh, like Jarvis Street and even outside of Mississauga, you know, uh, like Mississauga, we have Cowther or Jarvis, but also outside of Mississauga, you have an Oak Hill, for example, Chisholm. And these are all part of the same uh, time period too. So really it began to, the project broadened sort of on its own as we explored these things. And, and the criteria that we chose was I think adept towards incorporating you know, a lot more uh, names and places uh, into the study. So, so let's, let, let's focus on a few of them uh, and just to, to expand a little bit on, and, and we are inviting people to check out your published article series, which is gonna be published this month, uh, the five part series through uh, Modern Mississauga Magazine. Um, but uh, you know, chronologically speaking, if we will, let, let's start with the early one and, and Dundas Street. And uh, yes. uh, we've, we've referenced uh, uh, Sir John Grave Simcoe several times now yes. in, in, the, in our discussion. But can you tell us a little bit about the, the naming of Dundas Street and the inspiration behind that? Of course, Dundas Street uh, is named in the 1790s, and it's, it's fascinating because you have Simcoe come in, and it's an important period of development and settlement. Uh, in, in uh, English-speaking Upper Canada during this time period. And so Simcoe really, as, as, a, as, a, as a British uh, agent uh, in, in Canada, the frame of reference that he really uses is fascinating because he uses a very British frame of reference, but it's also in a way personally related to him. Uh, is that, and uh, I think with a name like Dundas, the... I think what we what we figured out is that Simcoe was the one who was choosing these names, right? This was something that was that was very obvious, uh, and I think that's quite true. Uh, is that he was the one who had the power, who had the economic power in him? That his the power was vested in him to lay down the names of these places, uh, and so and the names I think in their very personable nature to Simcoe reflect that because Dundas was named for the Viscount of Melville, Henry Dundas. He was I, I believe at the time. He was the secretary, oh, I forget now, but I think he may have been the secretary of either the colonies or yeah. the home secretary or secretary, home secretary of the colonies, yeah. Yes, secretary of the colonies, yes, correct. And, and he was in close contact with Simcoe. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think a, a friendship developed as a result of that. And eventually uh, there was, uh, I don't know whether it was he because he liked him or if it was flattery. Uh, eventually there was 
uh, Dundas Street was laid down. And there was also Dundas County as well. There was also, uh, it's uh, not, not quite as obvious, I guess, as a street, but there's also a Dundas County that was named at that time period too. But uh, like I said, Dundas is part and parcel yeah. uh, of, of this wide package of this wide trend in Sinclair's time because he also names roads after uh, Sir Young, who's also a close, the Baron of Young is a close friend of his as well. He's also in, a, in an administrative position in Britain. Right. And uh, Lord Addington as well. We, these were all members of the British government or were landed nobility. And York as well, named after the Duke of York. So his names had a very British frame of reference to them, uh, but they also had a very personable nature because of the, the his own connections, his own usually governmental connections, not just friendships, it's not just nepotism, it's usually official connections that he's had to people. And that was the basis by which he was able to choose these names. And of course, he was able to lay them down largely unopposed because he, he had the power to do so. He was the one who chose those names and he was the one who was able to, to place them, to put them into place. And it does, it does reflect also in the uh and this is outside of mississauga mind you but that what you're saying is again this individual sir john gary simcoe is the one who personally chose names because there are two townships up uh, north of barry called tiny and pay townships which uh the story is that they were named after his wife's dogs <laughs> and so you you have you have this you know again a very personal connection to the the selection of names and of course, then we have this, the, the modern narrative that we're seeing about the evaluation of, of Dundas Street and the reevaluation of his role in history. Now, Henry Dundas was never in Canada, probably whether he knew he had something named after him here or not, that's a little bit uh, obscure, I think. Uh, but of course, the, the, the conversation around slavery and uh, you know, the connection between uh, Sir Henry Dundas himself and his role in, uh, maybe uh, delaying the, the abolition of slavery in the British Empire versus John Gray of Simcoe, who did move legislation to see the gradual abolition of slavery here in Upper Canada, um, the first place in the British Empire to, to pass that. Um, and, and yet it's John Gray of Simcoe who had the personal hand in naming things. And so yes. the, there's an evaluation that takes place there in this conversation that we're having today over, you know, uh, and, and the, the, the accurate history of, of, of names and how they come about. Uh, oh, yes. Um, so from there, uh, you, you also talk, you know, from Dundas Street, we talk about uh, the, the family compact, and uh, this yes. would be in the era following John Gray Simcoe for, for the large part. And not that things were named immediately after members of the family compact, that seems to come about as the generation evolves. Um, uh, we have some references to there, and, and I, I don't know if you want to pick one. You've mentioned a few already, but if you want to pick one that uh, to focus on here and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I, I, of course. I mean, I think they're, uh, it's hard to pick one because they're very similar right. in, in, how, in how they're named down, I think. Uh, so you've got Ro Robinson, Kafra, Jarvis, and I guess there are, are different historical contexts for, you know, uh, for the, both those families and people. Robinson, for example, was a member of the Upper Canadian Family Compact. He was, right. he was a, a rather grand figure within the, the politics at the time. And you had Jarvis and Kafra who were uh, not part of the Family Compact, but were still prominent local figures. Uh, so I guess the context also, I guess, differs slightly for the people, for the families, and for the context in which name was placed down. But generally, I think those names uh, embody a very similar style in which the names are chosen uh, during these own families' lifetime. So they're not really commemorative in function. They're chosen by the families, uh, but they reflect networks of property ownership and networks of uh, community as well, because these names... Gener these names are generally laid down in places where uh, these families tended to own property, for example. So if they owned a house or a state or a farm uh, along a given area, then usually uh, the roads usually end up taking the name of that family too. It was even it was a big and small process. It was uh, even even just being a small holder, small property owner. We have a case, for example, of Hammond Drive. Uh, I think it was, I forget his name. I think it may have Oliver been John Hammond. Hammond. Oliver Hammond, yes. Oliver, Oliver Hammond. He wasn't, it, it, he wasn't, say, as major as, say, Robinson, for example. He was a member of the family compact. Or even maybe not even as prominent as the Jarvis's or Cowther family. They were major uh, landowning and merchant families. Uh, but he was a local physician and he was also a property owner. And he built his house in a given area. And that road uh, that he built his house on ended up taking that name. Uh, and so 
So, uh, of course, I, I think these, these names end up reflecting uh, the, the vested interests of property owners because the names were directly related uh, in direct harmony with the property that individuals owned. Uh, but they also reflected, I think, the local prominence of, of, of families because they had to be they had to be found there's a lot of social capital as well to be able to have that name and families like the Cather and Jarvis's who were who were very major rooted settler families uh in uh, in uh, Mississauga and also the Jarvis's uh, a branch to the Jarvis's also in Toronto I think they they absolutely reflect that they had they had a lot of social capital as well as real capital in the form of property right. uh, and that sort of concept of dual capital is how the uh, is how those road names were laid out and, and that they, they continue on our landscape and they don't speak to, say, some of the broader concepts of, of the, the international world, like the, the name selections that uh, John Gary Simcoe uh, came, up, came about, but that they remain as permanent marks on our landscape from an identifiable settlement type of period. And not that, you know, but perhaps they weren't the colonizers per se, but they were certainly part of that system at the time but they had a very local connection on people that yes. owned land there and helped to shape the society that became Mississauga. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I, it's very easy to think of, I think, roads, and I think I even mentioned this in the uh, last article on the family compact. It's very easy to think of roads uh, or anything, any, ty any, any toponymy or name that's, that's commemorative and celebratory to always really elevate world historical figures, really major figures like in the case of Dundas, uh, like in the case of, uh, of Simcoe's names for example the people such as Dundas or Young who were uh, major figures within the British government the British cabinet at the time uh, but really I think this local connection is also still crucial because a lot of these names in the case of the family compact you absolutely see this the names were absolutely localized there wasn't as much of an international connection there but they still reflected a power relation though they reflected who had the power in a given space in a given time and the family compact period of course it was these specific families because they had capital both both uh, both property and social capital right now we let's let's skip forward to what i found to be really a fascinating look and something that you took it in much greater depth than than, than i thought would come out of it but, uh, you know, we have, uh, sometimes it's a little harder when you have a surname and you're trying to search for its origins and whatnot. But, you know, here we have a major road in Mississauga that we know exactly who it's named for. <laughs> that, yeah, is, that is Winston absolutely. Churchill. Uh, absolutely. And there was never really any doubt about the era in which it was named. Uh, and and uh, kind of, the, it was a little eye-opening, I guess, in the process for why it was named at that time. I uh, wonder if you can walk us through that, because I, I found this look uh, that, that you did, the, the dive into the times of, of Winston Churchill, as, as absolutely a, a fascinating uh, chapter of our history here. Thank you. Well, I mean, uh, I, I agree. I think that was uh, that was the most interesting one to tackle. It, was also, it also ended up producing the longest of all the articles uh, as well, in the third and fourth articles. Um, Winston Churchill is, uh, and I think that's because Winston Churchill Boulevard is one of the best documented roads that we have in Mississauga. There is a lot on it. Uh, not only do we really know who forwarded the name exactly, uh, we also know who voted on the name. We know when the name was laid down. We, we know it all down to the exact date. The only thing we don't have is the hour at which the name was laid down, <laughs> but it couldn't be any more thorough. Uh, Winston Churchill Boulevard is a really fascinating name because it was, uh, the name was originally forwarded by Ron Cyril, one of these, uh, you know, Mississauga's full of larger than life political figures starts history. And Cyril is, is definitely arguably among them. Uh, who ended up being mayor later, but he uh, he he proposed the name. He wasn't mayor at the time. He was a he was still, I think, a, a councillor okay. in Toronto Township, uh, and he forwarded the name in 1965 mm -hmm. uh, at the city meeting, and it was voted on, and it was uh, eventually passed, and it was for a new highway that was being built, new major road that was being built in Mississauga at the time. Uh, and Cyril himself is, is uh, we know a lot about his life, especially through Heritage Mississauga and interviews with him and his documentation is that he was, uh, he very much, uh, I guess you could say was the dead ringer of, uh, of a very pro-British Canadian, or he represented this, this, this specific Canadian identity that was very much tied uh, to, to anglicized nationalism and to the English world, you know, very much defining Canadian identity in relation to, to Britain uh, is something that, that, uh, that he was that he was quite big on. Uh, and uh, Winston Churchill Boulevard almost seems to be sort of a, a progeny of that of that thought process and of that identity. 
uh, the, the road is also interesting because it's commemorative. The road was laid down in 1965. It's the same year Winston Churchill actually passed away. And so uh, I think it was to be laid down sort of as, as a commemorative road, uh, sort of to celebrate or sort of to, uh, not to, to memorialize sort of his, his, uh, his passing and his legacy. Uh, and it was laid down and it was voted on by the town council at the time. The interesting thing about and this and this interesting discrepancy that we have is that in, Can in terms of Canadian history overall, and this is where secondary research really helped because uh, when we place this role in the wider Canadian context, the national context, some interesting contradictions emerged because uh, it was named 1965. Uh, this was an important year because it was the same year that the uh, the new Canadian flag was, was actually established, uh, which is very symbolic uh, of, of the time period of, of Canada remaking its identity at the time, because there was this retreat from the, 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 Imper the British imperial identity that uh, still represent, for example, was, was something that was very big in, in the pre-World War II period. It started to diverge, it, it, Canada started to diverge from it, I think after the First World War, but it was still strong. But it, up until the World War II period, it was, it was a major part of Canadian identity. And then after the war, there's almost this crisis of identity that Canada has because it, it no longer really defines, it still defines itself as English nation. That's important to accept. And the flag that's, that's established uh, uh, in 1965 still really, still really embodies that. Um, but at the time, Canada is, 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 is trying to diverge to, mac, to make uh, it, its own identity in a way that's defined rather separately from Britain, from the United States, a very much homegrown vision of Canadian identity. Uh, and so to, in, the, in the 60s, especially is when scholars believe this process was, it was at its height or was accelerating at its most, because this is when the identity was being truly made. And again, the flag was, was very symbolic of that, the adoption of the new flag in, in place of the Red Ensign, which is a very much British flag, a very colonial looking flag. Uh, but then 1965, uh, Winston Churchill Boulevard is also laid down in Mississauga. And I think that's very fascinating. That this period in which there's a, very, there's a retreat from a British identity, it almost seems to be doubled down on in Mississauga. There's a celebration of a key figure who represents British identity, who represents the British empire. Uh, and he's commemorated locally right here in Mississauga. Right. And uh, I think the reason that we've attributed to that is because the the town council that you have represented this political old guard, and certainly Cyril was among them. Uh, and uh, we could say that they really, and I think you put past at one point in the project, is that they weren't on the advance guard of new Canadian identity making. Uh, they very much still... Uh, or at least this is what we believe, they very much still, uh, with Cyril especially, we know this, uh, they very much still look towards the past British identity and defining the landscape and, and, and defining uh, this, this new public and urban space, uh, which is why we believe Winston Churchill was laid down. Now, now I think, uh, and again, this is, this is why I think this project is important and, and why I think it should be, uh, it should be continued uh, because we didn't have time to look at this, but also understanding what the landscape looked like in Mississauga at the time, the social and political landscape, would be very valuable uh, towards this kind of thing. Because yes, it's true that the city council was voted in, and uh, it was very much still still an older city council that reflected older identities and older ideas. Uh, but we also would like to know how something like this would have been received in Mississauga, or, or how much the local community had to do with it. And unfortunately, this isn't something we had as much time to look at. We'd have to really look at the micro histories, the local history, uh, to, to understand what, what, what ordinary people living at the time, what was called Toronto Township at the time, uh, would believe in this name, whether or not it was popular, and whether the Mississauga community overall was also in on, on this British imperial identity, whether or not how they received this new Canadian identity can tell us a lot about the way the name Winston Churchill Boulevard was laid down and why it was laid down. And, and you also see in the discussion we have, and, and we've we've touched on this uh, earlier as well, but this this revision or review of these historical figures, and you know, I don't know if Winston Churchill was at his height of popularity in 1965, but he was still yes. an enormously influential and popular figure that you know had seen Britain through the the Second World War and had this uh, larger than life legacy uh, at the time, and. And of course, now we are we have, I guess, maybe the luxury of time and hindsight to review some of that legacy and, and start to find some fault with it. Although I dare say it's not isolated to these significant figures of the time. They're still products of Absolutely. their time. Uh, 
um, and you know, social consciousness and understanding of issues around race and uh, discrimination and, and and the like, they evolve with time as well. And uh, um, so you you certainly have this attachment to a legacy, like you said, the Mississauga doubling down on <laughs> Winston Churchill. Um, but uh, you know, how much of that was a deep dive into the life and times and opinions of Winston Churchill? Or was it more reflection of the ideals of the council of the time rather yes. than an examination on the, the life of an individual? Uh, and so, you know, th those are interesting interplays. Like you put, you, you've done an excellent job in your article series of placing the naming of, of the naming of roads within the era of which they, within the context of the era in which they were named. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And that context was key because, yes, I think Winston Churchill Boulevard now, we can assess it with our own. We do have luxury of hindsight and we have luxury of, of really valuable perspectives. Uh, but it's so fascinating the way in which the road itself isn't even, we always think of roads as embodying like a different time. You know, uh, it makes sense that this, this road was named after this figure because it was named way back then or it's an old road. Uh, but even in its own, even in its own time, it was so unusual because like we said, there was this new Canadian identity that was emerging that was, wasn't really valuing this old British legacy as much. And also Winston Churchill at the time wasn't very popular. Yeah. Uh, and, and perhaps this, this is more so in Britain, but we know that by, we know that by the fifties and sixties, he kind of fallen out. He was on the margins. Uh, in terms, as far as the political arena went, and his popularity in Britain was in serious question. But it's true he still was, uh, even after the war, even after his his own sort of uh, his own sort of popularity in Britain had had descended politically. Uh, he was still a, a major figure uh, of, of British Empire and still a major figure of British identity and resolve and very much a, a celebrated world historical figure who represented a really important, uh, like a, a really substantive for them heroic ideal. Uh, of of, uh, of of sort of uh, of sort of British politician, right? So. There, there's there's a, a, a an old saying about you know naming places and taking pictures of places that people do not name things or take pictures of things that they want to forget. Uh, and, and so you know whether or not that speaks to the individual themselves who is commemorated, or does it speak even more strongly about those who have placed that name on the landscape of what they are trying to to um, connect to um, you know maybe there's an evaluation that they're they, they both weigh equally but there's something about the identity of a community uh, about the names that they choose as well beyond the, the, the specific look at the individual um, so you know within this context of, of understanding how the names have come about and the the, the 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 review of those names in the modern context how, how do people today, how do residents today, uh, what, what can they do to engage in this story uh, of, uh, of uh, the conversation around uh, place names? And, uh, I, and I'm not talking about renaming things, but just uh, that exploration of where they live. Like, what, what are ways in which people can become engaged in that conversation? Of course, of course. I, well, I even, I even try to approach this discussion in the first article, uh, the introductory article. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we, renaming is definitely an important part of this conversation uh, around understanding the colonial connections uh, embedded in, in, you know, our public places all around us, especially in, in Mississauga and in the Canadian context. Um, but I, I think the most important conclusion I've had for this project, it was summed up by, uh, funny enough, this early article, I think from 2016, 2017, the Toronto Star, it was about uh, the uh, BLM movement in Toronto wanting to rename Jarvis Street. Uh, the, I, for, I always forget the suffixes for the roads because they all blend together at the end, but I don't remember if it was Jarvis Street Boulevard or Avenue because we have our own Jarvis Street in Mississauga. Yeah, it, was the, it was the, yes, it was yeah. the Jarvis Street in, in, in Toronto. Uh, and in the article, they, uh, they, they specifically talk about the fact that the, of uh, Jarvis's history in Toronto as a slaveholder. Uh, and they call that legacy in the question. But then the conclusion they have is really fascinating because they say, you know, we don't really care for the name to be changed. You know, we, we don't exactly, it's not exactly what we're advocating for, is what we want to do is bring attention to this kind of thing and then have people, you know, be educated yeah. uh, so for, for, this, for this to be publicized. And I think at the core, that's the important thing about this project is renaming is an important conversation that people should have. But I think what this project should inspire and what ordinary people should, should really consider uh, is, just to, is just to be able to know the history of these places, to know why it was named, to know what it represents, to know 
who it's named after, what the figure represents, understand all the perspectives, uh, especially if it's on a contentious figure, uh, like say Dundas or Jarvis or Winston Churchill. Uh, so I think that's at the core of this project is public education. People just understanding the history, knowing, uh, knowing, knowing its place and knowing its context uh, is the crucial part of it because these conversations are always going to be important to have. I agree completely. One, one of the things that uh, has come to mind just as hearing you talk on, on, on that point, um, we, we spoke earlier about this conscious desire of, of uh, naming things based on, on British ideals and this erasure of Indigenous place names. Uh, part of me wonders if, if in, in some fashion the replacement of names on the landscape continues that tradition of erasure. Uh, in a sense, and and, uh, and perhaps it's better to, as you're suggesting, perhaps, although we need to have the conversations around the appropriateness of, of place names, but perhaps it's better to educate around existing names than it is to yes. remove names. Like there, there, there is perhaps a, a possibility that you lose the opportunity for education uh, around a place name with the removal of it, because I, I, I draw reference to the statue that was removed in, in South Africa of, of Cecil Rhodes and then the artist imprinting the, the, the shadow on the ground. And yes, you can remove a name, but the shadow is still there. So let's address the shadow. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think you're right. And that's another important thing to keep in mind about when we're examining these names too. It's very easy to get caught up within the current uh, of, of, of saying the name should be changed. And once again, I'm not going to criticize it. I think I have my own personal views on the matter, but as far as the study goes, I think uh, having conversations around renaming is still important to bring attention to a legacy, uh, right? Or to publicize something of this sort. But what's important is to not lose sight of the, of, of the social issues around them. Uh, because the fact of the matter is a road name or a statue is, uh, it, it is merely but a reflection. It's an extension. It doesn't really represent uh, the, uh, or, or, or well, it, it's, it's not the, um, I'm not sure how to put this. It, it's just an arm, I guess you could say. It's an extension of uh, settler colonial ideas and for, of marginalization and power relations in the landscape. It, it does not embody those things on the whole and removing them isn't you know, necessarily going to rhythm. Uh, so we should be very conscious of the fact that these names should be flashpoints for us to discuss wider issues, especially nowadays with issues around the marginalization of indigenous people. This is something that's it's an absolutely critical conversation to have. Uh, we, we should remember the, these places should be flashpoints for those discussions. They shouldn't be the end of those discussions in sight, which is also why the, the, the educational role is, is absolutely crucial here, uh, because we want people to be able to be conscious of those names, of those histories, of those contexts, of those individuals, and of those legacies, uh, so that they can be better informed about discussions about the, more, the really substantive social issues. I, again, you couldn't. I couldn't have said that better. I mean, that that is so true for the core of this project, and really how it's evolved. I think at the beginning, uh, you know, to, let's uh, wrap this up by going back to the beginning. We had this idea of where this project might go, but uh, it really has opened up some eyes and some some, uh, some new avenues of thought, um, and has become all the more important with the evolution or the evolving uh, discussion that is going on around place names and uh, identification of those names. So with that, with that, Omar, I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up and we'll draw attention to uh, the article series that's running through Modern Mississauga Magazine. Um, and we'll have links available and that's running through uh, five issues through July and into August uh, that explores your, your findings on this. And I, again, uh, amazing work, but I always get the feeling that we're scratching the surface here. And uh, uh, there's that old adage about the tip of the iceberg, right? Yes. <laughs> there's there's a lot more to go. Uh, but uh, thank you, Omar, for the work you've done, for spending some time with us here at Ask Historian, and for sharing your incredible knowledge base on the, uh, the, the naming of places, those colonial connections, uh, and understanding that larger context of conversation around uh, evaluating and reevaluating our connections to the landscape. So Thank you very much for, for spending time with us here. And thank you for the honor to have the chance to discuss it and publicize it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you for spending some time with us here at Ask a Historian. And thank you also to Omar El-Sharkarwi for exploring and sharing 
his findings through his research project of colonial connections and naming Mississauga. It is, was fascinating throughout the academic year to share in Omar's research and his insights. And check out our Wayback Wednesday article series this month, as in a five-part series, we explore Omar's findings on colonial connections and the street names in the city of Mississauga. Thank you.